All right, welcome to the weekend, folks, and this is a special edition of the Short Vol Show Live, and, you know, one of the main reasons that I started this channel was to dispel a lot of what you hear about uh, the stock market and trading. I mean, the information that's out there on YouTube is just terrible, and one of the things I hate most is, uh, which I talk about all the time, is this image of, like, some dude who like gets up, trades for 10 minutes on the open, and then because of that 10 minutes a day that he quote unquote works, he finds fame and fortune and just messes around with his Ferraris and jet skis and makes millions of dollars. And it's so easy and he just, you know, doesn't even break a sweat. And I think there's a lot of people online who like to convey this cool, hip trader thing where like, you know, that, that same thing, that you're just confident, everything you do turns to gold, you know, you've got a boot camp, and you've got five people following you, and they all, you've taught them all how to make money, you know, maybe one out of 20 only made like 100% this week, and that's not the truth, and I'm here to tell you, and I also think that a lot of people might feel that like, well, they don't quite, they've been trading for a bit and they don't quite get it, but they'll get to that point where it's easy now. Like they found their secret little indicator or their, you know, they've got this setup, this pattern, and they've learned to work it. And now everything's cool. And they just wait around for their pattern and, you know, their ship has, set, has come in. And I'm here to tell you it's not like that at all. Um, Part of trading is very frustrating because, and that's our first emotion to talk about here, folks, is frustration. Emotion number one. Uh, trading can be very frustrating for a number of reasons. And one of the reasons is it is a solo pursuit in the end. That's why like a, the idea of a boot camp uh, or a um, doesn't make sense to me because in the military, you're learning to act like other people. You're learning to follow directions. Now, a trader has to have a certain sense of sense of self-discipline and discipline about the way they do things. And that's something that's taken me a long time to develop. But um, in a sense, uh, if I'm given the same set of circumstances twice, I, I will always kind of act the same way because I've, I've managed to... Um, um, have a mechanical way that I go about doing things that doesn't change based on my emotional state. But that being said, trading is a, is a lonely, lonely profession. Um, you and it's really um, you can really see that if you're on a trading floor because although you're surrounded by people and it seems like a sort of a social environment, you have to isolate yourself in your own head and. That's not to say you have blinders on, you can't see what's going on around you, but you really have to play an internal game of deciding what you're going to do and, um, and how you want to execute things. And you're not going to have the same setup as people around you uh, a lot. Sometimes you might, of course, but um, the odds are you're going to have a different setup than the people around you. And thus, when you make money or lose money, you have nobody to share it with. You know, if you, uh, I found it so many times that my own family doesn't understand what I do. If I make money, then, and I come in and say I make money, then I, I seem like a jerk. You know, I'm like, nobody wants to hear about some guy making money. Like, oh, great. You know, great. Somebody else made money. How exciting is that for anybody to hear? Nobody wants to hear that. And if you lose money, that's even worse because A, you have the pain of losing money, but B, people around you are going to be like, oh yeah, trading's gambling, you know, you don't have a real profession. You're just, you're just, you could be going to the, the casino really with what you do and, you know, they give you a hard time. Um, and I've faced this from my own family uh, at times, um, you know, trading is you're only as good as your most recent trade in a sense. It's not like you, um, I guess in certain firms, their pay structure, you build up to like senior trader where I, I guess maybe you get a salary or you get a little extra for teaching people or something. But in the strictest sense of trading, you make money or you don't make money based on what you do. And you have to go out and make the donuts every day 
or at least you've got to come up with new concepts from time to time or new trades because what you're doing over time is not going to continue to work. That's one of the uh, sort of truisms of trading. So the first emotion that I find myself in is frustration. And I found myself in this emotion a lot this week. I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, funware, okay? Funware. I um, This is a stock that it has a very small float. So it's... Um, very scary because it got a, it, it got into the uh, it got listed on the Nasdaq by a little exemption. You're supposed to have a minimum float of I believe two million shares to get in the Nasdaq. Well, this had a float of two million shares, but like I think something like 1.8 million of them were restricted. So it started trading. I think the float was something like 144,000 shares when it started trading, and as a result of that they bought this thing up to $550. You can see the spike here. Then um, then it started whipping around. It got down to about 50, then back up above 300, back to 100, back to 50, back to 20, back up to 60. And at some point, more shares were going to come on the market. And what happens when more shares come on the market? Well, the people sell at least some percentage. If you own shares and you're finally able to sell them, at least some percentage of the shares are going to get sold. And it's called dilution. Now, instead of 144,000 shares, there's 144,000 plus X and the thing goes down. And that's what happened with this with this issue. You know, I was lucky enough. I was long from 13 to 14 and a half. I sold it. I didn't get hurt on the way down, but it got to six. This stock got to six uh, earlier in the week. You can see the action right here. And I managed to avoid this whole sell-off here. I bought it for like 13, sold it at 14 and a half, and I had no position all the way down to here. It gets down to this five area. I bought it for, I bought a thousand shares for $6, right? Nothing happens, nothing happens. I give up. And then of course, yesterday, it goes from six to, uh, what, 10? It got up to 11 after hours. So that would have been a huge profitable trade. And of course, I don't have any position on. Frustrating as heck. But what can you do? You're, you're going to miss out on things, right? Another thing, UVXY. You know, I'm tweeting, oh, yeah, it's, you know, today it finally gets the all-time low. It breaks through the all-time low. The all-time low before today was 35.08, I believe. Uh, it was 174 days ago that this was trading uh, to its all-time low. And that 174 days for this to hit an all-time low is a very long time. I saw some stat that this breaks through its all-time low an average of like 3,000 times a year or something. And I know that's just ticks, but um, you can see this huge spike this year, which is a very extraordinary event and is not typical of UVXY. But um, such a long time, right? Well... I was short this uh, for a couple weeks. It was hanging out here around this 36, 37 level. In this whole area, I was short this, right? And then um, I cover the short. And, you know, a day to two later, days later, days later, it goes straight down. Massive frustration. Now, you know, I didn't lose any money. I... Um, and in, in this fund stock, I didn't lose any money. In fact, in both of these, I made a small amount of money, but I missed both the big moves. Extremely frustrating to me. It's just, it aggravates me. It's like, oh, I can't believe it. Um, here I am, the VIX guy, right? The VIX guy on YouTube, and I miss the big move down in the VIX. And this isn't the first time that this has happened to me. But once again, I didn't lose money, but super, super frustrating. And that is part of trading my friends it's going to be frustrating for you and to the point where like you know people will come up to me and say oh the vix is down awesome that's awesome right dave and i'll be like yeah awesome okay so let's move on to another emotion to do with trading and i think we all can relate to this uh the second emotion would be boredom okay um and i'm gonna use the example of it being the weekend right now though this can go in both frustration and boredom. Okay, the, the weekend's coming. There's nothing to trade until 
uh, Monday. And and yeah, you could I don't know you could trade some futures. It trades all the time if you really want to. But um, even when the market is open. It's a lot of time when nothing is really going on. And if you're a disciplined trader, you have a niche, you have a certain product that you follow, there can be nothing going on for long periods of time. And you've got to sit there and take it and just have patience. And it can be very boring. Um, I used to think when it's sitting on the floor, I would think, well, or standing on the floor, uh, sometimes I would sit on the steps if it got boring. But I would think, wow, it's an exciting job because you never know what's going to happen. You can come in. It can be boring for half the day. And then all of a sudden, something happens. And the market goes crazy. And all of a sudden, here's your opportunity. The most opportunity exists when there is something happening, volatility is going on. But you never know when that is exactly going to be. And there are periods in between that are extremely, excruciatingly boring. And it can lead you to overtrading. Um, I feel like I've actually overtraded this year. Um, I got my commissions reduced a lot last year, but I still have spent, you know, I, I think $3,000 on commissions since the beginning of the year. And I don't know, to some people that will be not a lot at all. Other people that will be a ton. But for me, it just seems anything I spend on commission just seems like wasted money. It's kind of like, um, like I can't bring myself to buy a nine volt battery at the store because they cost like four ninety five for one battery. It doesn't matter how much money I have in my account. I still I can't bring myself to to spend money on a nine volt battery. And it's the same thing with commissions. It's like I look at that and it doesn't matter how much money I have. Um, it just seems like a waste. And being bored makes me over trade sometimes. I'll, I will. I'll close one position. I'll find one thing that's moving. Like the stuff I have on, my positions won't, nothing will be going on. And something will be moving around. And I'll be like, oh, okay. Let me free up some capital so I can jump on that thing that's moving around. And, you know, so for some people that will work out. But in the end, that's probably not the best thing to do. Probably the best thing to do is to stick in your little level layer, layer of expertise and uh, stick it out. But boredom is a major emotion. And if you, you know, if you were to uh, look from the outside at the trading world, you would not think that um, frustration and boredom were some of the overarching emotions of a trader. You would think it was, I don't know, like lust or something. Uh, but okay, so, so frustration. I mean, I still can't believe Funware, how could it possibly go back up to eight dollars? I mean, it's getting diluted. There's, you know, there's more and more shares coming on the market. There's going to be a ton more shares coming on the float, and yet it makes this freaking gap from five fifty up to eleven dollars. Really, <laughs> it's so frustrating. I can't tell you how frustrating that is. And UVXY, you know, I, I, I was looking at this when it was seventy dollars and saying, oh, I'm going to put the forty, you know, the the, I'm going to put, when it's $70, I'm going to put the 50-40 put spread on and I'm going to double my money. But then like something else happened, I moved on to something else. And before you know it, this thing's $32. And I've been short it some of the way down, but what was the reason why I wasn't short it all the way down? Me here who's teaching about the VIX, talking every day to people about contango effects. And yet, for a variety of reasons, I wasn't sure on the way down. Very frustrating. And, you know, I know that there's a world of what ifs with trading. It's just like anything else. It's like you walk down the street and you see, well, I could have bought that property. It's tripled in value. You know, I could have gone, I don't know, pick your place. I could have gone to San Francisco and bought a property and with tripled in value. And I had the money and I didn't do it. There's always missed opportunities in the world. But in trading, for some reason, they seem more in your face all the time and um and that is a frustration that builds inside of me okay and so the third uh emotion might be one that you could maybe guess a little better it's funny in in europe they show i think threes like that sorry like that and in america three is um like that but um the third emotion is fear and this is the one that can get you actually in the most trouble. Um, 
And um, fear comes from um, when you're long something and it's going straight down. Or, you know, um, I put a lot of eggs in one basket. Um, I'm going to give you a fear example here of the stock uh, FGEN. And um, I kind of need to stick around 50. That would be the best thing if it just didn't do anything. Well, it wasn't doing anything for like a week. But today, look at this, the price action. It went straight down. I mean, there was like no upticks the entire day. It just went straight, straight down uh, against me. And um, and this, you know, it's frustration, but it's also like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I've got a lot wrapped up in uh, in in this trading stuff. Um, I've got, um, you know, I, I have risk on. I, it it has real consequences when you're a trader and you have risk on. It has real consequences in your life. Um, and yeah, they will say, well only risk 2% of your portfolio or whatever. And even doing that, if you just continue to lose, you're going to end up losing money and it's not going to work out for you. Um, certain positions will, you know, you'll, you'll stay up at night because you're thinking like, you know, when you're short, when you're short the VIX, anything could happen overnight in the news that could, and it could spike and it could ruin your year. Um, and it already happened to a lot of us last in February um, of 2018 there's tons of reasons to be fearful and once again it's kind of like i guess if you're not if you haven't traded before you could maybe compare it to like fantasy sports or something where like you have if you're playing fantasy i don't know like maybe baseball or football you've got certain players that you need to do well and and you've got certain risks that other people don't have and so it's your own personal it can be your own personal hell in a way because you have these fears and you don't really have anyone to share them with. Now, social media and this whole tri it seems like this whole tribal thing and social media has grown in the last couple of years. And social media in a way tries to make trading like more tribal in that if you look on stock twits many times on these threads it will be longs versus shorts. You know, everybody who's long is kind of like on the same team and everybody who's short is kind of on the team and they're against each, you know, they're against each other. And that is kind of uh, new uh, because, you know, on the floor, every, nobody really knows each other's positions and you're kind of not, you know that the market is so big that you aren't competing directly with anybody. In fact, if you have an opposite position from somebody, you can both go hang out and have a beer or something because it's not like you traded with that person. And so it's uh, it's kind of a different thing. I'm gonna gonna look here to the um, right here to the chat for a second. It says um, the casino gambling line people give is so annoying. It's only gambling if you make it gambling. Yeah, yeah. I mean, first of all. Um, I like to, you know, we like to say uh, as a market maker on the floor, we, just, we like to say, well, we're the house with gambling. Casino gambling is a proposition where your expected return is to lose. Wh why would you want to do something where your expected return was to lose? And I know people, they want to do it because they think irrationally that they will be that one person who doesn't lose. Like they will get lucky or they have luck with them. And I, I get to witness this all the time, working a day a week in this gas station place. Um, these people come in, they walk around like they're the exception to the rule of scratch tickets, and they always win. And people actually buy into this. Oh, that guy's lucky. He always wins, as opposed to everybody else who doesn't. And that's just, uh, it's, it's self-delusion. It really is. Um, trading options, you can put the odds on your side. Um, and with, you know, trading a future, at least it's a 50-50 shot. It's not the odds heavily against you. Um, and, you know, I will identify trades sometimes that are a long shot. And a long shot is really not what you should do if you're going to trade for any consistent level of time. Because as we know, as the number of attempts goes towards infinity, your expected return will match the actual mathematical ex expected return. So, um if you're a full-time trader, you want to be doing stuff where you are like laying the odds and letting somebody else take the long shot 
and you are collecting the money the whole time until that long shot maybe goes against you. Let's see what else we have. Any chance we see VIX under 10 next week? Well, that sounds... Um, it's anything's possible. That sounds pretty aggressive, though, to me in one week. I mean, it took us a while. If we look at the VIX, it, it has taken us a while just bouncing around from um, between 12 and like 14, right? Um, we would have to take out the highs. I, I believe we'd have to take out the highs in the market um, and then just continue to roll up slowly for this to chip back down towards uh, towards 10. It certainly can happen. We certainly could break the all-time low of 8 and change. But once we get below a certain level with the VIX, it's kind of like a spring that's coiling down. It's harder to push it down once it gets to a certain level because there are more people sort of defending it. And they're, I mean, it, just look on any uh, chat room and you hear people saying, every time the VIX gets to 11, I'm just a buyer, which I don't, uh, agree with, but um, there are those people out there, and they will support the market to some extent. I think we could get to ten this summer, but I think it would take, you know, the slow rally of another few weeks. I, I mean, it's certainly possible. It's certainly possible, but I, I would say it would probably take another three weeks to a month of the slow grind upward for us to hit er, and break through ten. Um, I hope that helps you. Uh, Talib book, yes. Read every Talib book. He is uh, amazing. I think that's uh, inspirational. Um, selling volatility will always end up bad. I don't like to use um, always or never with trading. I, I think you can have any position on. Uh, it depends on the prices that you have the position on for. So there is a price that even the most ardent anti-vol seller should be willing to sell vol for. And there is a price that the the guy who is a perma short, the VIX, should be willing to buy volatility for. I think price is dominant over position as far as a trader goes. Um, you can collect some profits with a 90% probability. I also, we have to make the distinction between the VIX and VIX ETPs because the VIX, as we, if we look at a chart, the VIX oscillates, right? It goes up and down, up and down between like, if you look at the chart behind me, it's going up and down between like nine and change and like 25, right? VIX oscillates up and down. So you could definitely say, well, if I could buy the VIX, which we can't, we can only buy futures or something else, or ETPs, you you could say I'm going to buy it at 10 and sell it at 20, but VIX ETPs, there's the chart looks a lot different as you know. VIX ETPs look like that; they go straight down. So, um, in the long term, it, you can always make money selling VIX ETPs because in the long term they are going to decay to go lower, no matter where the VIX goes. Uh, certainly, in the short term, um, you want to look at where the VIX is and we're getting low in the range right now so that needs to be a factor in your determination of pricing but another factor in the term in your determination of pricing of course has to be contango and right now contango is 15.56 percent so let me just lay this out to you okay 15 percent so UVXY is 32 right now right so 32 times 15% equals 4.8. So what that means is if the VIX stays right here, okay, UVXY is going to go down by $5 in one month's time if with Contango at 15%. So this thing, VIX stays, uh, VIX stays right here, this thing's losing $5 in, in a month. That's just the math. So let's conservatively say the VIX, the UVXY is 33 right now, it's going to be 28 in a month with Contango here. Now, Contango is probably not going to stay at 15%. If it stays to the average we've been seeing lately, it will be about half that, and this will lose $2.5 per month. But still, that's $7 in the summer, conservatively $15 if we take a more aggressive approach with it. Um, and that's pulling down. Now, the VIX can slowly 
slowly creep up and UVXY is still going to stay in the same place. So think about those dynamics when you think about buying uh, UVXY. I do agree uh, with the commenter that says there will always be volatility spikes. The, the VIX will not stay where it is now. It will go higher than it is now in the future. For sure, for sure, for sure. There is no doubt that there will be another spike. Um, we don't know exactly when it will be. But in the meantime, these we have to remember the, the, the volatility ETPs, that being UVXY, TVIX, SVXY, ZIV, and um, VXXB, which is becoming VXX again, they do not act like the VIX. They don't have charts like this. They're sideways oscillating. They have charts that go straight down. And so um, they are not representing buying and selling volatility. And we have to be mindful of that. So, um, so our three emotions, fear. And everybody has fear for some reason in life. But when it comes to your money, for some reason, it, it, it seems more important. Um, I don't like losing money. Nobody likes losing money. It's an emotional thing. Uh, and when you get people on a trading floor altogether who don't want to lose money and they start losing money, you get fights, you get um, people acting irrationally. You know, it's all well and good to when you're making money um, to be rational and to be have it together. But if you've sat there and you've lost like half of your account, how do you trade then? How do you react then? And um, it takes experience and it takes having been through that before uh, to, and it takes practice to be able to act in a rational way, to act the same way regardless of what your account has done. Um, a lot of times I think that um, it's time to reset. If you've lost a, a bunch of money, it might be time to reset. It might be time to take stock in what's going on. It might be time to get smaller. Um, I think a lot of us, when we risk an X amount of money, we, we, we don't, we're not emotionally prepared to lose a lot of it. You know, if we, we risk $10,000, all of a sudden we lose $9,000. If, uh, I'm sorry, we start with $10,000. If we lose $1,000, does your plan completely change? If it does, then maybe you're trading too big. Um, you want to be have a plan ahead of time. Well, what happens if I bet ten thousand dollars and I lose twenty five hundred of it? What would be my plan then? Am I going to stick with whatever the strategy was, or am I going to bail out? Because if you're going to bail out, you should know that ahead of time, and you should craft your trading accordingly. I found with myself what happens a lot of times is I put a big risk on. I think I feel comfortable with it, but then if I lose a little bit of money, all of a sudden. I no longer want that risk on and I want to bail out. And that leads me to um, not being patient enough and missing some big moves sometimes. Anyways, I don't want to get too much into strategy. I just want to talk about the emotions today. Uh, I have that emotion of frustration right now because we're closed in the market until Monday. I'm sure some of you share that emotion with me. Um, thank you, everybody, for your comments and input and I know it's a long time till Monday. We have a short week next week. Good Friday is off. Uh, that will be Friday coming up. And there's a bunch of, um, you know, there's Passover coming up and Easter. And um, so there you go. I will see you in the next week. And try to leave those negative emotions behind and enjoy your weekend and not look at the market so you can be refreshed on Monday morning. Thanks for watching, folks. I'll see you in the next one.